In a previous video, I took apart a sterilising device that was designed supposedly for use in fridges or freezers, possibly even cold rooms, and my, my opinion was that it creates very small quantities of ozone, that's how it had its effect. However, the version I bought was the 220 volt to 240 volt version, but they're also available in 12 volt versions and 110 volt versions. So having bought the 220 volt one, I uh, broke it apart and depotted it. And the circuit board inside, you can actually see how this one just barely fits in there, contained a voltage multiplier, a capacitive voltage multiplier with an array of double diodes and uh, capacitors that uh, was kind of mid-tapped. So you had a positive end and a negative end. And I thought that was really impressive that they managed to get the circuitry into such a small area. However... I decided to see what did they do to the uh, American version for the 120 volts since that wouldn't really work. So I bought one and the difference is that instead of being potted in like this, let me just show you a little picture because I've already taken this to bits. Instead of being potted in directly, it had a little black module with the potting in it and then that was sat sideways with the uh, electrodes coming out for the, the uh, carbon fibre emitters and then the, the power leads. So I set about dissolving this, and unfortunately it didn't dissolve too well. It, I ended up, last night, I ended up staying very late and using heat to get the thing apart, and it was extremely messy. But let me show you what was uh, in the unit once I'd actually uh, completely removed all the potting compounds. So I shall zoom up just a little tiny bit here. So... The unit has a little transformer on this side of the circuit board. It's a tiny little pulse transformer with a, a primary winding and then four sections of uh, very fine windings going up to a very high voltage at the other end. And you've effectively got a low voltage end of the circuit board and then a high voltage end of the circuit board. And recess, there's lots of uh, holes through the circuit board, partly to let the potting compound pound go through, particularly say here, these two are underneath the high voltage transformer. These two are basically just to let air out and let the stuff flow around. But at this end, because you've got very high voltage on either side of this, it also has a big hole there. That's why the circuit board split while I was trying to uh, heat it and get the resin off. That's how I did it in the end, a heat gun, and then paring away at it. It was very time-consuming. So the high voltage end is very simple. There were two capacitors here. These big surface mount capacitors, and they are pretty big this time, uh, there was one at either side, 280 picofarad, quite a small value, but it doesn't have to be big for this application. There are two high voltage diodes, couldn't get any information off those because I'm scrubbing away at them to try and get them out of the potting compound. But one points uh, to one diode, one points away, uh, capacitor, one points away from the other, and they basically create a high voltage across those capacitors. But the interesting bit is the input. I should actually finish talking about the output first. Uh, it creates a high positive voltage in one capacitor, high negative voltage in the other capacitor. They're common at the other end. And then there's a couple of resistors in series. That's the first one that actually pinged across the room in a random direction. Uh, but there's two 10 mega ohm resistors in series to ensure safety if someone touches the bristles. And it is a uh, ultra, ultra current. It's like super microamps in the output. The input is much more interesting. There were two SOT23 surface mount components. Initially, I thought they were both uh, thyristors, but it turns out one was a thyristor, but one was a double diode. And the marking on the thyristor was K06, I think. It was a wee bit unclear because once it's in, been in potting compound, you're trying to scrape things away. Sometimes it removes marks. The other one I scraped right across the middle of it the double diode, um, which I thought was a thyristor, but turned out to be two diodes. Uh, but the closest I can come to that is a BAV23A, which is a dual diode rated for 200 volts, which would be quite useful in this instance. Other things worth of note here. So you get a little transformer on the other side. This capacitor, it's a 100 nanofarad capacitor. It's in series with the transformer. We've got a 200K resistor down here, which is used to trigger the, the uh, thyristor. And then we've got two 22K resistors, which I've scuffed off the front, but fortunately read the correctly, and you can kind of read it anyway, which are in series, and they act as a current limiter for the circuit. Is there anything else worth mentioning here? No, let's cut straight to the schematic. Here is the schematic. I shall zoom in on this. Because it's quite interesting. It's very, very minimalist.
So the idea of this circuitry is that it generates a high voltage. In this case, it generates a high, high positive voltage and a high negative voltage, and then it applies those to the carbon fiber emitters, which are these little bunched emitters here. And they have marked them uh, with a bit of white sleeve round one. And it's got a thinner bunch than the other, the one with the black sleeve. I think that may be deliberate. I th because uh, traditionally an ionizer would be a dominant of neg dominance of negative ions. But in this case, they need both polarities for the plasma cluster effect. So they may have chosen a thinner bunch of the positive uh, carbon fiber tips. The reason they use carbon fiber is because when you apply high voltage to a very sharp point, normally in the old days of ionizers, it would have been a needle. When you apply an ionizer, a high voltage to a sharp point, it basically it creates a very high charge in the surface at the, the sharpest point and it can actually impart charge into the air or take charge out the air. Um, with carbon fibre, the strands are so ultra fine that it's just like the ultimate ionisation points. So uh, it, they, by using a clump of the carbon fibres, they basically have just thousands of tiny little needles uh, for that charge. Let's take a look at the circuitry. So we've got the two resistors in series, and they are charging up the 100 nanofarad capacitor through the primary of this transformer. The little transformer, let me just pull the little transformer out here. The little transformer here has a coarse primary, and then it's got four sections of secondary windings, very fine windings. Because I gouged right through it before I could actually measure things, because I was basically cutting through the resin blind, even though I was trying to pair it off in very thin layers. Uh, I can guess what the windings would be. The primary has uh, quite coarse windings on it. I did file it all down flat and uh, then looked at it with a, a high power magnifying glass. Actually, a microscope in, in, in the end with that because it was so tiny. But the primary had uh, fairly coarse windings. I'll, I'll make a wild guess. Two ohms. Maybe one ohm, maybe two ohms for the primary. And the secondary is one, two, three, four common at one end and going up to the high voltage end. They've got them separated so they can't flash over. It means that there's less voltage across them. So say, for instance, they were aiming for 2,000 volts. Uh, they would only have 500 volts across each section, and that just means it's less light to fill. And uh, they're very, very fine. I guess, because I couldn't measure it, I'd say 1,000 ohms for the secondary. Could be more, could be less, but that's a rough guess what it might be. So the primary bit, the coarse bit, is in series of that capacitor. Let me show you that capacitor. It's that capacitor there, because the transformer's on the other side of this. And it gets charged up when this leg of the, the mains in, incoming AC supply is positive. So when it's positive, current flows, and I'll do it by conventional current theory and not electron flow. Current flows in via these resistors that limit the current, and it charges this capacitor up and series this coil. And this diode down here provides a current path back to the other leg. So that's on the point that's positive and this is negative. The capacitor will charge up and series the coil. When the polarity flips, and when this then goes negative, and this goes positive, the current is blocked from going into the, from discharging that via this diode here. But what it can do, it can go via this 200k resistor to the gate of the thyristor and turn the thyristor on because that's effectively positive. And the uh, cathode of the thyristor, which is finding, which the gate's reference to, can find its current path back via this diode. Uh, it effectively turns that on. And because thyristors, because they're very nature, as soon as you trigger them, they suddenly turn on. And when it turns on, it shunts that capacitor and coil together. Um, they're in series, so whereas that was a very slow current build up in the coil, now what happens is you end up with a sudden current spike in this circuit, and it induces a magnetic field into the transformer, and it generates a high voltage pulse on the output of this. The rising pulse will generate a polarity, say, out outgoing positive initially, and it will pump that capacitor, and then as the magnetic field claps again, you'll get a negative voltage, and it will uh, charge that capacitor with the negative uh, side of that. There is a clamp diode across there which will protect the uh, 
which not only provides that alternative path for the cathode for the trigger, but it will protect that from back EMF spikes to a degree. Um, although you'd think that it would also have a clamping effect on the uh, the collapsing field, the generation of the high voltage there. But having said that, the diode isn't directly across that coil. It's in series with that capacitor, but that capacitor would still take a bit of a charge. Not sure about that. I should draw a little dot there to show they're connected. So um, that means that basically in America, on 110 volts, this would, cycle would be happening, happening 60 times a second. Uh, so this would just be kept topped up, these capacitors, with a high positive voltage and a high negative voltage, current limited via these resistors, and then the little carbon fiber emitters would uh, want to create a current flow. They'd want to put a charge into the air, but because it's pretty much a short circuit, if you look at the fibers under extreme light sensitive camera conditions you'll see tiny little dots of corona purple corona discharge on the needles because the the tips of the carbon fibers because they're in the vicinity and if you put these modules in a bag and run them and then you sniff the bag later if they're in a confined space you can actually smell just a little tiny hint of ozone and that's all that's needed to actually have the sanitizing effect i think that's how they work really so that's the difference uh, between the uh, UK one, the higher voltage, the 240 volt one, and the 110 volt one. And technically speaking, they could have used this for 240 volts if they'd just put an external extra resistor or change the value of these resistors because on the half cycle, all they needed to do was have a high enough value resistor that that capacitor only charged up to say 100 volts or so or whatever it would have charged to with the uh, 110 volt supply. And that would allow them to use it for a quite a wide range of voltages. Uh, there is a 12 volt version. I'm guessing the 12 volt version probably has a little step up circuit, a little oscillating step up circuit. Which, but then we'll use a similar transformer like this with a little pulse circuit to actually pulse that through. Maybe even just driving this, the, that uh, directly. I've not got one of those and opened it yet. So things worthy of note. The diodes, the high voltage diodes, you can't just measure them with a standard diode tester because they actually have uh, several junctions in series, you know, technically speaking. Hold on one moment. I'm just going to test this. One moment, please. It has been tested. It took 15 volts across it in the forward direction to get it to start passing 10 milliamps. These things generally aren't rated for a very high current, but the, that suggests an awful lot of junctions in series, maybe 15 or 16 or more junctions just sandwiched in series to make up the high voltage diode. But that just leaves the 12 volt one. I'm kind of, uh, I'm trying to remember if I've ordered one of those or not. I really should uh, investigate that and see what circuitry they've used. But I'm sure the manufacturer of this will be absolutely delighted uh, that I'm completely reverse engineering all their products. Hopefully they don't get too ratty about that. Uh, but this is the, uh, this is the 240 version and that's the 110 volt version, very different. I'm guessing that the reason they went with a voltage multiplier for the uh, higher voltage one is because they could, and also because this transformer here is without doubt going to be one of the most expensive parts of the thing because it is a custom wound high voltage transformer. And then you get the high voltage diodes as well, whereas with this one, you just had these unusual diodes, which the markings in the diode doesn't relate to the voltage they were being used at. Very odd. But the circuit does work. But uh, very interesting. Uh, one of the most interesting things about this is that it's shown that the, because of the sharpness of the carbon fibres, you don't need such a high voltage to get the ionisation effect. It's, it's got advantages over the needles. And also, the putting of the fibres in the vicinity of uh, the opposite polarity or even just ground, because th this could effectively find a path through this to, to the ground via the mains again, but putting them closely in the vicinity does actually encourage the, ion, the ionization effect. I think that's what the plasma cluster units by Sharp do. And uh, that results in a greater instance of, it makes it easier to create that corona discharge. And that's the important bit that does split molecules, the air molecules apart, to create ozone and various other compounds, including potentially hydroxyl radicals, which are all very fashionable at the moment. But there we go. That was, it. that kept me up all night. I was like, I meant to go to bed yesterday at midnight, ended up going to bed about four or five in the morning. And even when I went to bed, 
my head was just full of schematics and trying to reverse engineer this in my mind before I'd actually analysed it. To actually find what these components were, I had to take them off the circuit board. I had to actually uh, get the leads bent down a little bit so I could put them on this unit. And then I tested them this unit. And it showed that one was the thyristor. And the other one that I thought was another thyristor turned out just to be two diodes with a, a common anode. So very interesting. Uh, very neat circuit indeed. I really enjoyed reverse engineering this. And the simplicity of the circuit is very neat. It's very, very clever.